a little girl symbol of the civil rights movement. The story of Ruby Bridges. Ruby Bridges, the six-year-old, doesn't know why she was insulted, threatened, and thrown things at when she was just going to school. Her appearance at her new school worried the president enough to assign federal officers to escort her. The threats were so frightening that she was mentally shaken. Even so, she still went to school without fear. Her fearless attitude led her to become a symbol of the civil rights movement in South America. What happened to Ruby Bridges that she had to face such hatred? We will talk about it further in this video. So, don't forget to support this channel with like, comment, and subscribe. Since the Plessy v. Ferguson case in 1896, the Supreme Court has ruled that segregation of public facilities between whites and blacks is legal, as long as the facilities are equal. These facilities include transportation, hospital services, and other public facilities. The racial segregation of facilities was even made into a law called Jim Crow. The doctrine of separate but equal continued to last for decades. Practically, the doctrine was not implemented as it should have been. The whites and blacks were indeed segregated, but the facilities provided were not equal. This was proven in the 1950. Lawsuits against the law came from the states of Virginia, Delaware, and South Carolina submitted by the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or NAACP. The NAACP handles anti-Afro-American cases. One day in 1951, Linda Brown, a seven-year-old child, asked her father, Oliver Brown, to be moved to a school closer to her home when she reached the next grade. The reason was because her school, Monroe Elementary, was too far away, almost two miles by walk and bus. It tormented her, especially during winter. Later, Oliver enrolled her in the white-only Sumner Elementary School in Topeka but was rejected. Among the other three cases, the Topeka case in 1951 is more famous. Oliver took this unfairness seriously. He joined the NAACP along with three other segregation cases in 1952. The Supreme Court called it the Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka case. Attorney Thurgood Marshall, head of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, accompanied them. He argued that Jim Crow laws and a 1,896 Supreme Court ruling violated the 14th Amendment's Protection Clause. If not implemented as it should be, at least the education system should be truly equal in both curriculum and facilities. The lawsuit faced a complicated issue, as white parents were concerned about their children studying with Afro-American children. The justices under Chief Justice Fred M. Vinson clashed. Vinson himself thought the 1,896 ruling should stand. However, in 1953, Vinson died and was replaced by Earl Warren, who was then serving as governor of California. On May 17, 1954, Earl successfully decided against segregation in schools. He erased racial segregation in all schools in the United States. Segregation in education is unacceptable, and the state must ensure education for all children regardless of race or skin color. In May 1955, the Supreme Court handed over segregation cases to lower-level federal courts and school boards to implement desegregation in schools. The transfer of cases to lower levels was intended to avoid local desegregation both politically and judicially. Not only parents, but school officials also felt conflicted about Earl's decision. Six states including Kansas and other areas in the American South refused. The rejection affected the little Ruby Bridges, who had to face the anger and protests of the parents. Ruby Bridges is the first child of eight. She grew up in a poor rental farming neighborhood in Tyler Town, Mississippi on September 8, 1954. This was exactly three months after the removal of segregation in all states in the United States. In search of greater opportunities, the Bridges family moved to New Orleans in 1958. His father, Abon Bridges, was a veteran who had fought in Korea. He worked as a gas station attendant, while his mother, Lucille Bridges, worked at night to help support the family economy. The eldest, Bridges, was sent to a kindergarten far from where she lived. In fact, only five blocks from her house there is a kindergarten school, but it is reserved for white people. The desegregation law is slowly being implemented in southern state schools. The Louisiana State Legislature did many things to delay the desegregation process, but in the end, they gave up. By November 1960, all schools would be integrated. Black children going to all white elementary schools had to take a bunch of tests. The tests were made with a difficult composition of questions, so that students would not easily pass. The tests were also conducted to ensure that black children's abilities were equal to those of white children. There were six black students who took the test. One of them was Ruby Bridges. At first, his father was against Bridges taking the test. 
Abon knew that there were many risks involved in making such a decision. However, Lucille managed to persuade him so that Bridges could take the test. Bridges as an adult understood the actions of his parents who wanted a decent education for their children. For her parents, education was a luxury as they could not go to school and had to continue working in the fields. Of the six students who took the test, only Bridges successfully passed. Her other friends either failed the test, withdrew, or were sent to other schools. Bridges became the first black student to attend an all-white school in the South. Beforehand, in 1957 at the Little Rock School in Arkansas, there was an uproar when nine black children were about to take a test. To prevent a chaos from arising, President Eisenhower ordered a federal marshal to escort Bridges and his mother to school on November 14, 1960. Bridges, who was only six years old, did not know that she was enrolled in a whites-only school when she got out of the car while being escorted by federal marshals from the front to the back. The atmosphere outside the school was chaotic. Police were everywhere. People were angry and barricades were set up. Bridges thought instead that it was Mardi Gras. A celebration held before the beginning of the Christian fast known as Lent. Bridges spent his first day in the principal's office all day. Parents forbade their child to go to school. She received threats without knowing what she was doing wrong, and no teacher wanted to teach her. Except, that is, Barbara Henry from Boston. Bridges learns with Henry, plays with Henry. She was forbidden to leave the principal's office as the desegregation protests continued. The first year was the toughest for Bridges. Every time she went to school, protesters shouted at her and threw things at her. On the second day, a woman threatened to poison her. Federal marshals then asked her to bring lunch the next day. Since then, Bridges has always brought lunch to school. One day, a woman carrying a black doll in a coffin frightened Bridges. Slowly, changes happened. White parents began to let their children return to school. At first, Bridge was left separated from the other students. They were kept away from where Bridge studied and not allowed to interact with her. At Barbara's insistence, at the end of the first school year, Bridge was allowed to join the other white students. It was here that she was introduced to racism. A classmate said that he was not allowed to play with Bridges because of the color of her skin. Bridges realized that this was not just a Mardi Gras celebration. By her second year, the protests had begun to die down and Bridges no longer had to be escorted by federal marshals. However, she still often brings lunch because she still fears the threat of a woman last year. More and more black students are finally enrolling in her school. Barbara did not renew her contract at the school, and she and her husband returned to Boston. The threats faced throughout the year and Boston's departure stressed Bridges out. Bridges began consulting with Dr. Robert Coles, a child psychiatrist who felt concerned for Bridges. Coles gave Bridges voluntary counseling sessions once a week, at home and at school. During the counseling sessions, Coles allowed Bridges to tell him about the burdens on her mind. Ever since her parents divorced over school matters, Bridges felt it was her fault. Her father lost his job at the gas station and her mother was fired out of the blue. Her grandparents in Mississippi were evicted from the land they rented and the grocery store near her house refused to serve them. His father was unable to provide for his eight children, so he decided to separate from his mother. She always had nightmares and would run to her mother's room in the middle of the night. When Bridges saw the coffin and the doll, she started dreaming of the coffin circling in her room. Bridges was getting tired of eating lunch alone since Barbara left. She started going to the cafeteria with other friends. So, she left the sandwich under her desk. A few weeks later, a janitor found her sandwich under her desk, which had been crawling with mice and cockroaches. Her family lives on donations from kind people. Her father is employed by a kind neighbor. The neighbors also often look after her younger siblings, guard Bridges' family home, and walk Bridges to her school. Dr. Cole's relatives sent Bridges beautiful school clothes, clothes that her family could not afford. The support from the people around her helped a lot. After graduating from William France Elementary School, Bridges attended Francis T. Nichols in New Orleans. Although the school was desegregated a decade ago, the legacy of racism was still strong. White and black students still do not integrate, which is still apparent on the surface, one of which is the name of the school. Francis T. Nichols was one of the controversial Confederate generals who was heavily involved in the establishment of the slavery system. Not only that, the flag of the school's sports team, the Rebels, bears the Confederate symbol which became a point of argument between white and black students. In the 1990s, the school finally changed its name to Frederick Dolas High School, with a new sports team name as well, Bobcats. Later she studied at the Kansas City Business School. Fifteen years of her life 
were spent working as a world travel agent for American Express, a job that eventually took him far away from Louisiana. After much traveling, she met Malcolm Hall and married him in 1984. They had four sons. Bridges returned to Louisiana, whose citizens had forgotten the 1960 incident in front of William Francis School. In 1993, Malcolm Bridge, Bridges' younger brother, was murdered in relation to drugs. The tragic incident brought Bridge back to her old elementary school because she had to look after Malcolm's children who went to William, France. In 1995, Dr. Coles, who had become a professor at Harvard University, contacted her. He intended to release a book inspired by the tough life of Bridges at the age of six. Earlier, when Coles was counseling the stressed little Bridges, he had also sent several articles to the Atlantic Monthly. The articles were later turned into a book about how children deal with change. The children's book published by Coles is titled, The Story of Ruby Bridges. The book immediately gained the attention of New Orleans residents. Many people talked about and finally knew the terrible events Bridges faced at a young age. An incident that should not be faced by an innocent child who is considered dangerous just because of the color of her skin. After her younger brother passed away, Bridges was motivated to set up a foundation with book earnings. The Ruby Bridges Foundation was established in 1999. She volunteered at William France connecting parents and the foundation three days a week. She then created a special art program because of the lack of art programs in schools. She also speaks at many schools to promote cultural understanding. With her unforgettable experiences, she brings parents to play a more active and caring role in their children's education. In 2005, Hurricane Katrina destroyed Willem Francis' school building. The school was almost demolished as the damage was quite serious. Bridges then organized a campaign to prevent the school from being demolished. She proposed that the William France School be included in the National Register of Historic Places, providing the school with funds for construction and building expansion. Her efforts were successful and today the school still stands. Unfortunately, William France School is now only filled with black students. Hurricane Betsy that occurred in 1965 made white residents move out in the mid-60s. Today, the district is one of the poorest in the city. The phenomenon of white flight has occurred in many schools in the United States. Bridges realized that the painting created by Norman Rockwell in 1963 represented the moment when she first went to school escorted by four big men. The painting entitled The Problem We All Live With was used as the cover of Look magazine on January 14, 1964. During the Barack Obama presidency, Bridges suggested that the painting be displayed at the White House to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the desegregation of South America. Obama agreed inviting Bridges and his family to the White House. In 2011, the painting was displayed for four months in the West Wing of the White House. Today, the painting is part of the collection of the Norman Rockwell Museum in Stockbridge, Massachusetts.